So as I mentioned this morning, the, the subject matter tonight for what I'll be preaching on is basically it's how much control does God exert over the world, right? How, how much is God influencing the world that we live in? We, we can see from Scripture He clearly is having an influence. But to what degree, to what extent is He doing that? What, what boundaries is He setting up for Himself? This is what we're digging into tonight. We're going to look at some... Um, key passages to help understand and to help explain, you know, where does God draw the line for himself? Where does he, you know, is he, is he a puppet master in charge of everything? And we don't believe that here, like a Calvinist type of, of understanding of the Bible that, that says that everything that happens in the whole world is a direct result of God being in charge of everything that happens. And essentially what that does is alleviates any responsibility for anybody having done anything to say that, well, God's the one that's ultimately responsible for everything. And that's a false doctrine. That's a heresy. That's blasphemous. And um, that's not what we believe. However, we do need to look at these passages and see and, and recognize that, you know what? God does have power and he does have influence and he does cause things to happen in this world. So let's take a look at some of these examples. We started off in Ezra chapter 1. And we see here, this is, this is after the children of Israel have been in captivity in Babylon for a long time. And now it's the, um, the Persian Empire, right? Um, Nebuchadnezzar had come and gone. And we're in the first, the, the, year, the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. He's a king of Persia. And at this point, the children of Israel have spent enough time in captivity. They're 70 years or whatever before they could go back into the promised land. You know, to, again, to fulfill the prophecies that was that was given of how long they were going to be in captivity before returning. So in order for these things to happen, we see God stirring up the spirit is the word that's used here. Let's look at verse number one. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled, as it starts off saying, it says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And then he says, who, you know, basically, who's among you who wants to go back and do the building and do the work for this stuff, and he's going to help them out, and he's going to, you know, just, just bless them in their endeavor to rebuild this temple. Now, there's a lot of things that you could, you could speculate about Cyrus. Was he a saved man? I don't know. He probably was. I'm guessing that he was, if God's stirring up his spirit to do this. But it, 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 it's inconsequential. We see here, saved or not, God's stirring up his spirit to do something. It's, it's to the end that the prophecy is going to be fulfilled that's already been put in Scripture, that's already been spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah. So this needs to come to pass, and God's going to make sure that it comes to pass one way or another. But one of the things, one of the, what, what I want you to pay attention to as we're going through this, we see God leading people and, you know, causing things to happen. I put cause in quotes because he works by using people to influence other people without necessarily exerting direct control. So stirring up Cyrus's spirit is not controlling Cyrus like a robot. He's stirring something up inside of him to do something. And, and again, what is exactly does that mean? I can't tell you specifically that, the, you know, going down granular to the details of exactly how, what does that mean to stir up his spirit. But you could think of, you know, having these thoughts and, and having these ideas or maybe having a dream, however, however it came to him to, to stir up his spirit to do this. We see Cyrus is choosing to do this. He's writing it down. He's, he's, he's making it happen. But his spirit was stirred up. I mean, you think about you, you, when your spirit gets stirred up to do something, no matter what it is. You want, you want to get involved in, in one thing or another. You, you have this urge. You have this desire. Where does that come from? I don't know. I mean, who knows where, where some of these things come from where you want to go and get involved with something. Well, this is the way that I read this is Cyrus's spirit was stirred up. I was stirred up from the Lord, but to do this great thing. So... The, the, the wheel gets put into motion, so to speak, and, and he's, he is, um, gives all kind of help for this to happen. Now, we're going to find as we go through 
the vast majority of instances that we see God making sure his will is done when it comes to kings and to nations. God has, has much more, we see God getting involved much more often when it comes to an entire nation or, you know, entire group of people, some major impact like of a ruler and, and you know, impacting a ruler's life maybe to, to, to cause an event to happen that, that impacts a lot of people. More so than just an individual for an individual purpose. Now, we do see events, we will see events of God having influence in an individual's life for an individual purpose. That does happen too. But when you're, when you're going through and kind of looking at all the times that God's getting involved, more often than not, it has something to do with a, a nation. And usually it's a nation of Israel. We see this happening throughout the, um, the book of the Kings and the Chronicles and that type of history where God's even getting involved in the battles, right? It, when the, he says, when you come to me, when you've got your faith in me, he says, you don't have to worry about your enemies because I'll fight for you. So that's one example of God getting and saying, yeah, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm here to take care of you. I'll make sure that no one's going to be able to defeat you well, as long as you're relying on me, as long as you're trusting me, as long as you know, you're not going after strange gods or anything like that. And then on the flip side, when you forsake me, when you have nothing to do with me, then guess what? I'm going to bring judgment and it's going to come from these other nations around about you. You're going to be brought into bondage. You're going to be brought into captivity, you know, and you're going to have all kinds of bad things happening to you as a result of you forsaking me. And that's, again, uh, examples of God's involvement. We'll turn, if you would, back to Genesis. We're going to go look at Genesis chapter 11. I want to skim through. There's, there's quite a few of these. Quite, there's, there's many examples of God's involvement. And we're going to look at a lot because it's important to understand the nature of God's involvement also, because it, it's all going to make sense at the end, but um, we want to, we want to get a good feel and, and understanding how is God getting involved? Why, you know, because some people want to blame God for everything, right? And say, well, why didn't God prevent this from happening? And why, why did this happen to me in this, you know, and, and everyone wants to blame God. Well, God's not always directly involved in everything that goes on in this world. He simply isn't. And I'm going to prove that to you also. I'm going to prove that to be false. But we don't want to, so we don't want to get the false sense of, well, we read these different stories. Well, God's getting involved here and here. Well, why doesn't, you know, and blame God for not getting involved in something that you think he should have. Right. But let's, let's just see generally what, you know, some of these various events that happen. Look at Genesis chapter 11, verse number eight. We're going to see this is when the people are gathered together and they're building the Tower of Babel, Right? They're, they're all come together into one place and they want to build a tower up to heaven. They want to work their way to heaven, right? The people are all one, one language, all working together. Verse number eight says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So, God didn't like what people were doing. God didn't like what mankind was doing on this earth. He didn't like that, hey, they're all speaking one language, they're all working together, and, and this is what they've come to do. This is what has come out of their heart, is to build this tower up to heaven, which is a picture of works-based salvation. And we see Satan loves the one world government. He wants a new world order. He wants there to be, you know, everybody working together for this goal of, you know, immortality or you know, making your way to heaven, whatever that, whatever that may be. God doesn't want that to happen. So we see in Genesis chapter 11, he does something about it. He gets involved. He steps in and he says, okay, well, they're not going to be able to work together very well if they can't communicate with one another. So he confounds their languages. And here's where we see God creating various languages. And I mean, ima imagine, I can't imagine what that would have been like to be working together on some big project or you got all these other people, you could all understand each other and then you go in the next day and it's like people going, ha, blah, 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 and you, know, you, just, you have no idea what they're saying, like what? And then you say something and like, you know, they, have, they don't know what you're saying. So this, is, this got them to form 
nations according to who could understand who, right? You got groups of people, well, I could understand your language, and that kind of drove them apart, which was God's plan anyways. When he wanted them to go and be fruitful, multiply, he wanted them to go out and inhabit the earth. God created the earth to be inhabited, not to have some super mega city where everybody's living together in one spot. He wanted people to kind of branch out and start to, um, you know, take dominion over the earth. And they weren't doing that. So here's an example where he steps in to fix that. Genesis chapter 12, the next chapter. Look at verse number 15. We're going to see an event here with Abraham or Abram at this point. We'll start reading verse number 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. Talking about Abram's wife, Sarai. Verse 15, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen, and he asses, and men servants and maid servants, and she asses and camels. So you remember, the story was that Abram told his wife, tell him you're my sister, because he was afraid that they were going to kill him when, if, if they knew that he was her husband, so that she, because she's so beautiful, he's thinking, you know what, these people don't fear God. And if they see that I'm her husband, they're just going to kill me so they could take her to be, to be a wife. And instead of having faith in God, but that's, you know, I'm not going to get too far into the story. So he just says, tell him you're, assist, you know, you're my sister and, and it'll be good and, and we'll get through this without getting hurt. And then it says in verse 17, so, so what happens is, you know, oh, it's this guy's sister? So Pharaoh's like, hey, let's, you know, we start treating Abram really good because he thinks... He's just her brother and then takes her into his household because she's a beautiful woman. He's probably thinking, you know, I'll, I'm looking to marry this girl. So I'm going to treat her brother real well. I'm going to, you know, get favor with her and then bring, brings her home. Verse 17 says, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So God was still looking out for him. And God decides to get involved. And God says, no, this is wickedness. No, this isn't going to happen. And he starts plaguing them. And um, of course, Pharaoh then in verse 18 says, And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why didst thou say she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. So, and, and this is fulfilling other scripture as well. So like God said that, that um, he was going to, Bless them that blesses Abram and curse them that curses him. And he's going to watch over basically and protect Abram. He's going to protect his prophets. And this is what he's doing here. And he's protecting him for uh, protecting his wife so that nothing uh, bad happens. So if you go to Genesis chapter 35. So that's another example of God getting involved. He starts plaguing Pharaoh's house as a result of them taking Sarai, Abram's wife. Genesis 35, this is, in chapter 34, is the story of Dinah when she commit fornication with Shechem. And her brothers were really upset because obviously she's supposed to get married and not supposed to be marrying the heathen of the land and all this other stuff. Dinah got caught up. She made friends of the area, these other girls that she was hanging out with. And then she, she meets up with Shechem. They commit fornication. Shechem really loves her. He wants to marry her, right? And he, and he goes to his dad and he's like, do, you know, whatever we can do, I want to marry this girl, right? And so they're, they're go over to talk to, to Jacob and figure out how can we, you know, how, how can we make this marriage to work? And her brothers find out what happened and they're really upset. They're angry about this. So Jacob was going to send away, but they're like, they said, no, no, wait, here's what you could do. And this is what, this is what you can do. And we'll let, you know, we'll marry your daughters and, you know, you can marry ours and we'll, we'll become one people. And see, Jacob was pretty wealthy at this time too. So there was a, you know, there was that motivating factor for them to want to come together. And what happened was, is that they said, well, you need to be circumcised like we are. We can't, you know, we're not going to approve of any marriages unless you guys are circumcised. So they circumcise themselves as grown men 
you know, it, it, there's a little bit of a recovery time for that. So they waited until they were at their weakest point. So if you think about a man, you know, I mean, don't think about it too hard, but a man being circumcised is going to put him in, in a weaker state to be able to fight. So when they're all like after about a day or two, they're at their worst point, real sore, not, not even thinking about being able to get up and fight. They go through and they kill everybody, all the guys. They kill them all because of what happened with their sister. Now that was, I mean, they shouldn't have done that. That was not a just recompense of what happened at all. That was wickedness. They shouldn't have done that. But what we see here, we do see God still getting involved. It wasn't Jacob. Jacob didn't do that either. He didn't tell them to go do that. They just went, they did it on their own, and, and they caused all of this problems, right? So now Jacob's concerned. He's saying, you know, when the people around us hear about this, we're all going to be killed because they're not going to put up with this. Because as soon as they find out that you slaughtered all these guys, you know, we're done for. But see, God had other plans for Jacob. Now, just so you don't, you know, God doesn't just let things go. He's going to make sure that Jacob's able to fulfill his will and, and not be, you know, murdered as a result of something that his sons did. And the sons aren't just getting off scot-free in this thing. They get, they're cursed later on. They don't even, you know, it affects their blessings way later down at the end and other parts of their lives. You know, Jacob's sons did not have the best lives. Because a lot of them did a lot of things that were not right. I mean, think about it. They tried selling Joseph into slavery. They did sell Joseph into slavery, right? I mean, they tried. They were going to kill him. There was all kinds of problems in Jacob's life. But um, what we see here is, I, I don't want to, I'm getting too far off on, on some of these stories. Look at verse number two of chapter 35. So then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garment. So we see here him taking an action. He's saying, you know what? We need to shape up. You need to get rid of these false gods. Get them out of here. You have nothing to do with them. Clean up and, and change your garments. He says, verse 3, And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, look at this, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So the way that God protects them, because normally if God didn't get involved, the people right in the other land would have heard about this and been like, these murderers need to be put to death. You're going to wipe them out. You know, take vengeance on the people that were slain in Shechem. But, like I said, one, we see them getting right with God and Jacob just being in charge and just saying, we're getting rid of all these idols and, and false gods and stuff. We're going to do what's right. We're going to go back to the altar of God. We're going to go and, and worship him. And then we see God putting the fear of them into, you know, just, just putting fear in them so that they're, they're questioning, you know, probably building up, oh man, these people are really tough. We're not going to go be able to fight against them. So let's just let them get out of here and be done with it. But this was something that God was able to put in their hearts so that they were able to, to get free in this instance. Genesis chapter 50, go all the way to the end there. We're going to see last chapter of the book of Genesis. Of course, and there's so many things that happen in Joseph's life. I'm just, I've just kind of picked and chosen a few, you know, various places here to, that we're going to look at where God's getting involved. And we're seeing the different ways he's gotten involved. He's putting fear in people's heart. He stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. We see that um, he was plaguing the, the house of Pharaoh for Sarai. You know, he's doing these various things, but they're all, I, I, want, you know, I want to say indirect. They're not him you know, taking control of a person's body. He's, he's influencing them through fear, through their spirit, through these things that are, that are you know, obviously have an effect on somebody, but not, uh, not a puppet master type of control, if you see what I'm saying here. Genesis chapter 50, we see Joseph summarizing, you know, all the things that happened to him. We know that God was with Joseph. We know that he was, you know, even in his worst situations, God kind of helped him through and helped him to get to a position where he was second in charge, just next to Pharaoh. 
And after Israel dies, the rest of, his, the rest of Joseph's brethren are, are worried now because they're thinking like, oh man, what's he going to do to us? After all that we put him through, I mean, we were going to kill him. We sold him into slavery. We told our father that he was dead. You know, we want to, I mean, that's, what do you do? Now this guy's got all the power in the world and dad's dead. He's not here to protect us anymore. So they got all scared and they went to him and they lied and they're just like, you know, dad told us this before, you know, before he died. You guys are, you know, but Joseph explains, look at verse number 20, Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20. He says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So Joseph is, is, is recognizing a bigger picture here. He's saying, when you did this, you meant it unto me for evil. You had bad intent. It was not a good thing. He's not just letting them off the hook. He's saying, you know, you had, a, you had evil intent. And, and that's not right for them to do that. But this event was used of God. God meant it for good. When all that happened, he, they were actually, you know, in a sense, carrying out this greater good that was going to happen through Joseph and bringing Joseph into Egypt and bringing him into a place. And, and Joseph was able to step back and see, wow, I could see how all this happened for God to use me in this instance to save much people alive here. And we see God, you know, God's hand kind of getting involved in directing him to get to that point. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 3. I don't know how much time I want to spend on this. I've got quite a few examples. But this is relatively important because what... In Exodus chapter 3, we're going to see the example of Pharaoh and Moses. Okay, and we're going to see God getting involved here to, to make sure that Pharaoh doesn't let the children of Israel go until all of his plagues have come upon Egypt. God wants to make known his power and his might. So he promises, he says, I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh so he's not going to let you go. This is the way it's going to go down. And he wants to make sure that everybody knows who the Lord is and how powerful he is. That's, that's you know, part of his reasoning for doing this. But the way that he does this is very important because this affects the, the doctrine that we believe in, of, you know, a reprobate doctrine. This is pointed to often as an example of, of how this works. But um, let's just dig into it and, and I'll try to explain it the best I can. Exodus chapter 3, look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord... God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And you shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. So in Exodus chapter 3, we see him speaking unto Moses and saying, you know, I'm going to bring you into this land, the land that's been promised to you. And he says, I know. He says, I already know. I'm sure of it. The king of Egypt's not going to let you go. You're going to go and I'm going to tell you, you're going to say, we need to go and worship the God, worship the Lord, and he's not going to let you go. So he said, but I'm telling you right now, he's not going to let you go. So this is, this is where we're at in Exodus chapter 3. Look at Exodus chapter 5, when Moses actually goes to Pharaoh and asks him, Verse number one, and afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. This is the first time they go to him, basically. And look at what he says in verse number two. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So the very first thing that he says, this isn't from God. This is Pharaoh himself speaking. I don't know the Lord. I don't, I don't know anything about him. You can't go, like, like, who is he? Why should I respect God? 
right? He has this proud attitude against the Lord and just saying, I'm not letting you go and do this. That was his response, and that was his decision that he could make at that point. Look at um, chapter number 7. Turn to flip over to chapter number 7. And we're going to skip through this because what you're going to see is the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart and also Pharaoh hardening his own heart. And it goes back and forth between God hardening his heart and Pharaoh um, hardening his own heart. Exodus chapter 7, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the, hand, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So there he's saying in verse 3, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. This is what's going to happen. He's not going to let you go, and I'm going to make sure that Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened so that he's not going to let you go. And like I said, if you, when you read through this whole story, we're skimming through and just kind of picking a few verses out of here. When you read it in context, first you're going to see God hardening Pharaoh's heart. At some points you're going to see Pharaoh's heart just being hardened and doesn't say who's doing the hardening. But look, if you would, at, at Exodus chapter 8, verse number 15. After one of the plagues, I think it's the plagues of the frogs. Uh, I'm not sure which one is. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Exodus chapter 8, verse number 15. It says, well, But when Pharaoh saw there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So in this example, we see as soon as there's a little bit of relief, as soon as there's a respite from the plague, he, he hardens his own heart. He's just saying, oh, okay, well, I'm out of this. And, and he hardens his heart. And then in verse 32, it says again, and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. So as you see God hardening Pharaoh's heart, people say, oh, well, it's not Pharaoh's fault. He didn't have a choice. Well, in some instances, you're right, because God hardened his heart. And you can say, well, I mean, you can't, if God hardens your heart, there's nothing you can do about it, right? I mean, God's God. And he says, I'm going to harden this person's heart. There's nothing they can do about it. But we see throughout the story that it's not just a result of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's having his own choice here still, even after many plagues, to harden his own heart and say, I'm not going to let them go. We see that clearly in the verbiage here. And the reason why this is important, and you know, this, this shows you a little about Pharaoh. God didn't just choose to harden someone's heart unjustly. Because a lot of people want to judge God and say, well, there's nothing he could do about it. It's not his fault. So what's up, God? Why are, why are you just hardening this person's heart? I mean, you can't hold him responsible. But this is who Pharaoh was. Pharaoh was hardening his own heart anyways. Pharaoh was the type of person that, that he was still hardening his heart and rejecting God. And when God just steps in and says, okay, now I'm going to harden his heart. It's not, and it's not like God just picked some random person for no reason and just said, well, I'm just going to harden this person's heart. Who normally, who otherwise would have had respect on the Lord, who otherwise would have been, you know, reasonable or would have, you know, would have gone along or whatever. He says, no, and he does it specifically with Pharaoh, who was lifted up with pride and I believe was a child of the devil. Now, turn it forward to Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1. Job chapter number one, we're going to see, of course, the famous story here. Job, in Job one and two, we see Satan approaching the Lord and coming before God and um, having these conversations with him. And God brings up Job and, and um, saying how righteous he is and what a great guy he is. Look at, look at verse number eight. Uh, we're going to pick up here in Job one, verse eight. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? 
that or thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So we see a few things here. We see one, that God was blessing Job. God was blessing him for his righteousness, for being such a great guy, for, for doing the right things. God blessed him for that. And then Satan's saying, well, look, you know, the only reason why he has any integrity towards you is because everything's going good for him. As we said, you made everything great. You blessed him so much. You know, you take that stuff away from him. He's going to curse you to his face. And of course, Satan's a liar. Right? He's the father of it, but he's the one confronting God. So God allows Satan to, to, to do things to him, but he restricts him. He says, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So he's saying he's giving him the power to touch his substance, his things, his possessions, but not he himself. And Job is a perfect example of someone who has all kinds of horrible things happen to him where a lot of people in the same situation might want to turn to God and blame God for it. But God wasn't the one doing anything evil unto Job at all. Satan was. Now you might want to argue and say, well, God let him do that. Well, God ends up blessing Job at the end, and there's always more purposes behind the way things happen. But God isn't the evil one. God isn't the one that attacked Job. We see here, um, so Satan goes and he, and he causes all kinds of, I mean, just the worst things in the world. He loses everything. He loses his children. He loses all of his material possessions, essentially. And um, we see that Job still doesn't uh, blame God for it. Job's living up to, to God's uh, exaltation, his praises of him. Look at Job chapter 2 now, verse number 3. We see the, the next... Um, meeting with, with the Lord and Satan. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all ye has Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So we do see still influence from God. And now in this sense, it's influence of allowing certain things to happen, right? He's not directly controlling any of that. He's just saying, okay, Satan, I will allow you to do certain things, but here's a limit on what you have to do. So it, it's... And you can see through the various examples so far we've looked at, it's a little bit complicated the way that God works and the way that things operate and the, and the way that, that things can be made to happen without his direct, oh, you know, um, direct control. It's kind of like, like an indirect thing. Jonah is another example. Here, here we're going to see an example you know, with Job and with Jonah. These are more personal examples. Remember I mentioned there's examples of people who, um, where it affects nations and kingdoms, such as with Pharaoh and the, king of, you know, in the land of Egypt and, and all the plagues that were going to happen. That affected a lot of people. And that affected all, you know, the children of Israel being allowed to leave and, and it allowed for um, God's name to be spread abroad because of all the things that happened. Jonah is an example where God, it says, and you don't have to turn if you don't want to. You can turn to, um, turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. We just went over this a couple weeks ago. Um, but in Jonah 1.17, the Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then in chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So there we see God directly involved in preparing this great fish, this whale, to swallow up Jonah when he was thrown out of the boat, and then also causing him to be vomited back up on the land, which is, you know, using animals to, to do what he wants to have done. Um, we see David and Saul's spear. You remember, there's a, it says, um, David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got him away, and no man saw it, 
nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. So when, when David snuck into Saul's camp, you know, and, and he was showing that he could have killed him right then and there, but he was proving to Saul that he wasn't out to kill him. He takes his spear, they go, you know, they get out of the camp and they say, hey, Saul, you know, they call unto him and they've got his spear and um, they're giving Abner um, a problem for that too because Abner's supposed to be keeping his Lord. But he says, um, it says here that there's a great, a deep sleep from the Lord was upon them. So God had caused them to be in this deep sleep so that they wouldn't wake up as they're, as they're sneaking through their camp. Another example of involvement of God in what's going on here on earth. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 14. We see the adversaries that are stirred against Solomon. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. For it came to pass when David was in Edom and Joab... The captain of the host was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. And the reason why I bring this up, and, and we're going to see the same thing in 1 Kings chapter 12. Uh, we went over that last week. But... Um, all of the people that God is using here, they all already have motivations and incentives to do certain things, and they're kind of just being pushed a little bit along that route. So what I mean by that is, in this example in 1 Kings chapter 11, Solomon's being punished for not obeying the Lord, right? God had given him peace on every side. There's going to be no more wars. That was a blessing because of David and because of the way Solomon started off. When Solomon starts getting into sin, God starts troubling him and, and making sure he's reaping some of what he's sown by, by getting into all kinds of sin. So now these adversaries, that's why God starts stirring up adversaries. This Hadad the Edomite, he already had incentive to trouble the house of David because of what happened to him and his family when David came in David and Joab came in they destroyed all the men so they he has this this history and a problem with Solomon but see it could have gone either way he could have remained in I believe this is when he was in Egypt right he could have remained in Egypt because he was taken care of in Egypt Pharaoh took care of him just fine but when God stir, you know, again, he's stirring him up, he's stirring up his spirit, he's reminding him of these things and kind of not letting it sit well with him that all this stuff happened. And he's saying, you know what, I need to go back to my land and I want to go and, and, you know, basically he's going to go and cause trouble for Solomon over everything that happened in his past. Whereas he could have just been pacified in Egypt without God reminding him of all of this stuff. However, God did that, you know, bringing up the past and bringing up this history, the incentive was already there, right? But, but now God just kind of stirring it up and maybe goading him a little bit, if you will, to go and do this stuff to punish Solomon. Um, the similar thing with Rehoboam and following the bad advice that caused him to lose the kingdom. We know that it was of the Lord. We know that the, the word of God had to be fulfilled and Rehoboam had to lose the kingdom. So the way that that happened was by him taking the bad advice from his younger, you know, the people who grew up with him, telling him to answer the people roughly. And that's what in verse number 15 of, of 1 Kings 12, the Bible reads, Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So, and again, there, there's the, the actual specifics of God causing this to happen isn't clear. Like, it's not just crystal clear. How is it that he made it more appealing for Rehoboam to accept this council over that council? I don't know. But we see the way in which God is, is kind of having involvement here. Apart from like hardening Pharaoh's heart, it's not this overt, direct involvement. It's, it's more of, of just kind of stirring people up to do things instead of just controlling them. And he didn't control Pharaoh either. All he did was harden his heart. 
right? Which was the path that he was already on anyways. Now, while there are examples of individuals like Job and Jonah, the majority of God's involvement has to do with judgment of nations. And this is what I want to cover. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, because now we're going to start to see a little bit more of a full picture of the way things happen, why God gets involved, and, and to what extent he's getting involved here with a little bit more detail. We, we've, we've looked over many various examples. In, uh, in Amos 3.6, the Bible says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? And that's a verse that might cause some people some problem, but it's actually not that difficult. First of all, you have to understand, evil isn't always wicked. Evil just means causing harm to somebody. So when uh, a good example of this is, you know, God's law has capital punishment for certain crimes. So if you're guilty of you know, murder, we would consider like murder in the first degree, you, you are guilty of murdering somebody, then you need to be put to death. The person that murdered the other person brought evil upon that person. Yeah, that's evil. They, you know, they killed that person. But there's also the executioner, the person who's just going to have the job of saying, you know, this person's found guilty, they are worthy of death. So the executioner that just carries out that sentence is also committing evil. Now, it's not wrong, it's not wicked, but they are doing harm unto that person. I mean, they're physically killing that person. They're bringing evil upon them. So I just bring it out there, you know, bring it up because it's important to understand that that word evil, the way it's used, especially in the context of the Bible, isn't always wickedness. Now, oftentimes it is, and usually it probably is, because when you're violating someone or hurting someone, usually it is from wickedness. But when God's doing it, it's not from wickedness. Well, it's, it's him being an executioner. It's him executing judgment upon people. So he's saying, look, is there evil in the city and I have not done it? He is bringing judgment upon various cities and saying, of course, you know, I'm bringing evil upon them because of, and it's not for nothing, though, it's because of their own actions. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36, we're going to start reading in verse number 11. The Bible reads, Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. So Zedekiah is not listening to God. He's not listening to the prophets. He is doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse number 13, and he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. And this is important. Look what he's doing. He's, he's refusing to listen. He's stiffening his neck and he is hardening his own heart. This is what Zedekiah is doing. Just, just to get the context of what is going on in this story. Verse number 14. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. So on top of all that, on top of Zedekiah hardening his heart, doing these things, the people are just in great, great sin. I mean, they're just doing whatever they want to do. They've polluted the house of the Lord. Look at verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. So God still, after all of this, we see God having compassion and just trying to reach out to them and saying, look, listen to my messengers. Listen, here's the message. Listen to them. You know, listen to what they have to say. But what did they do? Verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. There's no fixing it. See, God has compassion. God wants his people to listen. He want, you know, he's trying his best to get somebody to listen to him, but there gets a point with God when you Harden your heart when you stiffen your neck, when you're mocking God, when you have nothing to do with God, and you're, you're treating his, his prophets bad, that God gets angry. Now, God is slow to anger, but you know what? Once God gets angry, you better watch out. Because God destroys cities, he destroys people. He's, you know, it, it's not, um, God is not a God that you want to make angry. Look at verse number um, 
Because he says here, he got to the point where there's no fixing it now. You know, the people might start to try to turn to him, but it's too late. It's too late. You don't have that choice anymore. That option is gone from you. Uh, you were living in sin. You were living like the devil. You're living wickedly. And I kept on trying to help you, but you refused. You thought it was a big joke. You mocked. Now don't come to me when your fear cometh. And that's what Proverbs 1 is about. When their fear cometh and travail cometh upon them like a whirlwind, he says, then they're going to seek me, but I'm going to laugh. I'm going to mock them. Why? Because they didn't choose the fear of the Lord. Verse number 17, therefore, so for these reasons, because of all this stuff that happened, therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. This is God's judgment. He's using the king of another nation to, to, to come in and to destroy and to take captive the, uh, the people of Israel who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon, and they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. There was no remedy. I mean, God brought full destruction through the hands of the Chaldeans. Verse number 20, And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath till, to fulfill threescore and ten years." And again, you'll notice in, in what we've been seeing, there's a common theme, not in every single passage, but when Scripture is written, that word is going to be fulfilled. And if that means God has to have a hand in it and get involved in it, then he's going to do it. He's going to make sure that his word comes to pass without fail. And God makes sure that those things happen. Verse number 22, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it also in writing. And he goes in saying that, you know, what we already read in Ezra chapter 1. So this happens at, at the end of the 70 years for them to come back into the land. So we gain a little insight here. Now, turn if you would to 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings 22. So we see God getting involved was a result of these people getting in all kinds of sin and wickedness, hardening their heart, stiffening their neck. He gets involved, one, by sending messengers unto him. That's his first involvement. And his first involvement isn't just wiping them out. His first involvement is Hey, hear my words. Hey, listen to me. Hey, get on the right path. Hey, change your ways. Hey, you know, do what's right. Hey, believe in me. That's his first involvement, sending people to bring that message. And he does. God sends people. God still sends people to this day. But after they mock, after they despise God, after they want to have nothing to do with God, that's when he brings a judgment. And again, he gets involved again. Notice he's not getting involved in making these people believe him. The choice is up to them. There's, there's, there's consequences for their choices and their actions, but it's still up to them completely what they're going to do. The people that he's moving, he's moving people to do, to do certain jobs and sending people to do certain tasks. But not exerting overt control over every single individual. We're going to get a little bit of an insight here. Now, remember, a lot of things I said, I can't say specifically how did this happen, how did he stir up a spirit, what was ex you know, every little thing that happened in, in the process of a of, you know, person's spirit being stirred up. In 1 Kings 22, we're going to see a little bit of an insight into, into some of the how that these things happen. Because it's spelled out for us in 1 Kings 22. Look at verse number 20. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab? Because Ahab needed to receive some judgment. Ahab was a wicked king. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? So he's saying, I want Ahab to go up and fight and, and be defeated at Ramoth Gilead. So who's going to persuade him that this is a good idea to go and do that? 
And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit. Mind you, this is in heaven. This is like God having a conversation up in heaven. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. So we see a spirit in heaven saying, I'll go down and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And that's what happens. These false prophets, they didn't believe on the Lord. These false prophets go down and I believe we're possessed by a lying spirit. And they're, they're coming up with these, with these lies saying, yeah, I am. go on up, go, you know, go up to the battle, go out and, and you're going to prevail and everything's going to go good. And because that's what they were saying to him. And he said, you're right. Yeah, if, you, if, if his prophets are saying that, you want to go down, you can make his prophets say those things, then he will be persuaded. And that is one of the ways that, um, that God's influence was put on Ahab deciding to go to battle and for the judgment to come down upon him. Now let's go to some New Testament examples. We're almost done. I'm going to close this up real soon. New Testament examples, Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, we're going to see a, a, a positive example of God getting involved in our lives, something that's not like a judgment, but something that's good, and especially in the New Testament for believers. Romans chapter 8. There's an involvement of the Holy Spirit that benefits us. Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. The Bible reads, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So when we're praying unto God, they're saying, you know, oftentimes we don't quite know exactly how we ought to be praying to God in, in the right way and in the way that's, that's going to be according to God's will and, and to, to get the result that we really want to happen. Sometimes the things that we say don't match up even with our desire, with our intent of, of what we want to have happen. So the Holy Spirit actually intercedes for us and says, you know, it's kind of like a middleman saying, no, no, no. What, this, what he's really trying to say is this, God, you know, and, and communicates that with God, which is great for us. I mean, it's, you know, when we pray for things, sometimes we're just a little bit ignorant on some stuff and, and the prayer that we think we want isn't exactly what we really want. It's not the actual outcome that we would normally want to have. So the Holy Spirit's there to help make intercession for us and to speak on our behalf. And that is, that is a good example of, um, you know, God being involved in, in our lives here. Turn, if you would, to, uh, turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 19. I'm going to just go over some of these examples real quickly. Other examples, we, we touched on this story before in Acts chapter 12 when uh, Peter was put into prison and the church was praying for him. Remember, Peter's thrown into prison. The church is praying for him. But what happens? God sends an angel. The angel of God came upon him. It says, a light shine in the prison. He smote Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, rise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. So there's another good example of God getting involved directly in a person's life. He got involved in Peter's life and, and miraculously allowed him to walk right out of jail. And that's a direct involvement of God getting involved in somebody's life. I mean, he sent his angel to do it. But we see these events unfolding. Now, he didn't force Peter to get up and walk out of the prison. Obviously, it's something he wanted to do, but he, he, he made the chains come off his hands. He, he made it so that, you know, the guards didn't wake up, and he made it so that he was able to get out of the prison. Um, and what's important to understand in, in all of this, and this, I'm going to tie it all together right now, is that the will of the Lord is not always done on earth. So we see God getting involved. We see God making sure that his word will come to pass. That is something that we know will happen. And he proves that. And that's why I said in, most of the, in many of the examples we saw, 
there's also a reference of that the saying of Jeremiah the prophet might be fulfilled, that this saying might be fulfilled, that Rehoboam, you know, in, in all these events, there's, there, there were prophecies already made. There was men of God that already said this is what's going to happen. With, with, in, with Moses coming out of, you know, all these various things had to happen. So God kind of steps in and gets involved because his word cannot be broken. It is going to come to pass. But just because he does that doesn't mean that everything that happens in the whole world is what God, the way God wants it to be. And that he's just getting involved in everybody's life to just make sure that everything that happens is exactly the way he wants it to be. Otherwise, it would be silly for Jesus to give the model prayer in the Lord's Prayer. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So God's will right now, what God wants, is being done in heaven exactly the way he wants it to be. Everything in heaven is the way that God wants it to be. His will is done all the time in heaven. But the prayer is, God, we're praying that your will would be done on earth the way that it's being done in heaven because it's not right now. That's why we're praying and asking for that to happen because your will is not being done. And this is where the Calvinism totally fails because they think that everything is a result of God's will, that there is no free will, that God just makes everything happen. And why did Jesus say, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven? 2 Peter 3.9, of course, very famous, very easy refutation of that Calvinism false doctrine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. That's God's desire. That's what God, God's will is. But does that happen? No. Why? Because people choose whether or not they're going to believe. People can harden their own hearts. People can stiffen their own neck and not listen. There is no such thing as irresistible grace. It is resistible. But I'm not going to get off on the whole Calvinism tangent. Um, you're in Jeremiah chapter 19 just to show you that things are done on earth that are not according to God's will. It's just completely spelled out that God has nothing to do with a lot of the perversion and the wickedness and the things that happen in this world. There's complete sin. Look at Jeremiah 19, verse number 3. The Bible says, And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which... Whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle. God, God's really mad. He said, I'm going to bring so much problem unto this city that anyone who even hears about what happened here, their ears are going to tingle. They're going to be like, wow, I can't, you know, like that happened to that city. What would make God so angry? Let's keep reading. Verse number four, because they have forsaken me and have estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and, look at this, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal. Pretty good reason for God to be pretty angry, don't you think? Not only did they go and start worshiping false gods, but now they're burning their own children in fire as human sacrifices unto these false gods. And God's saying, that is so wicked and perverted that I am going to destroy this city with such a destruction that when anyone even hears about what happened, their ears are going to tingle. They're going to be like, wow. We don't want that to happen. But look at what is the finishing in verse number five. They burnt their offerings unto, the, for, they burned their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not. So was it God's will that they burnt their children in the fire? No, he didn't command it. He didn't speak it. Neither came it into my mind, is what he says. God's saying, that thought didn't cross my mind, yet people did it. So you're going to tell me that God's a puppet master in charge of everything when something as wicked as people burning their children in fire? Pay attention right now. That people doing something as wicked as burning their children in the fire... God, he said, that never even crossed my mind one time. I never thought of that to happen. And you're going to tell me that God's in charge of everything and controlling everything and all these wicked things that happen? That's a wicked God to serve if you're going to say that God made those things happen. God didn't make those things happen. Now, out of all of these examples, do you know the one thing that we never see an example of ever, not one time, is someone getting saved or damned 
solely on God, doing so completely unprovoked. Right? Just Now, we don't see anybody getting saved just because God says so. Just because I just want this person to be saved. Nowhere do you see someone receiving eternal life that didn't call on the name of the Lord, that didn't put their faith in Jesus Christ. We don't see that happen one time. It's impossible. He doesn't just say, well, you're just going to get it because I'm God and I'm sovereign and I'm just going to make you be saved. But we also see God not damning people randomly either. Now, do people end up getting damned? Yes, they do. That's why I said unprovoked, because you can do things to where God will end up saying, that's it, that's enough, you've crossed the line. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Changing the Word of God, among other things. And, and just completely rejecting God, flat out. Is God all-powerful? Yes. Yes, he is. But God also sets up his own boundaries. He's not incapable of anything unless he's already put a restriction upon himself. So a good example is that is being holy, right? In order for God to be holy, he has to restrict himself from doing anything that would be a sin. God doesn't sin. God doesn't break his own laws. He doesn't break his own rules. In order for him to be holy and to be known as being holy, which he is, he can't do certain things. Now, does that make him any less powerful? No, it doesn't. It's, it's, it's his own restriction and, and you can't, because you can't be everything. You can't be good and evil at the same time. You're either good or you're wicked. You know, God, God's can't be everything all wrapped up into one. All of the scriptures regarding salvation in the Bible are worded in a way that puts the burden of believing the gospel upon the unbeliever. It's their responsibility to believe. Nowhere does scripture say that God makes people believe. In fact, the scripture says that God is not willing that any should perish as we already saw. But people still perish. It still happens. Salvation is something that we need to choose. John 4.10 reads, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. This is Jesus again speaking with the woman at the well and, and saying, If you just knew, or if you weren't ignorant of this, if you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who it was, who, who I am, who's standing here to you talking with you, so if you all you had to, if you if you just known this, then you would have asked. He says, You would ask, and I would give you living water. But he didn't say, You will ask because I'm gonna make you ask. And and somehow force this upon you. He said, I know you would do it. He said, I know it's your will that you would do this. If you just knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me a drink, thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. The burden is on the person to ask for the living water. Joshua 24, 15, you have to turn there. The Bible reads, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, when it comes to who you're going to serve, it's your choice. It's up to you. God's not going to make you believe. He's not going to make you, he's not going to make that decision for you. He said, you choose. Now there's repercussions for your actions. There's, you know, the, whatever you choose to believe, there's, you know, there's, there's, it will impact your future. It will impact your eternal state. Of course. But it's still your choice. Obviously, one choice is better than the other. Right? I mean, believe, be saved, have eternal life. That's the best choice to make. It's kind of a no-brainer. But it's still your choice. You choose. Joshua said that to children of Israel. So you know what? You've heard all of God's laws. Here it is for you. You choose. Here's what I'm going to do. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You choose this day who you're going to serve. Now, if God did the choosing already, why is that in the Bible? Is that there just to confuse us and confound us and say, oh man, 
I thought I had a choice in this, but I, I guess I really don't. Deuteronomy 30, 19, same thing. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, right? This is in the law of God, like at the end of, of just Deuteronomy, giving out the law. I've given you life, death. I've given you blessing, cursing. Here's my words. You could follow them. You could be blessed. You could, you could listen to my commandments or you could refuse them and reject them and have cursing and have death. He says, therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. But it's your choice. Choose what you want to do. That is something that we'd never see God getting involved in. Now, does God get involved in certain situations? Yes, he does. God will step in. God will make sure. But even in the events that he's getting involved, except for maybe when he's just hardening somebody's heart, the way that he gets involved is, is really rather indirect. It's, it's kind of stirring people up. It's, 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 it's prompting without just like possession, right? Like demonic possession where a devil will take over someone's body and just control them. We never see God just exerting total control over people. We see him leading. We see him guiding. We see him influencing and, and allowing things to happen, but not just directly controlling what you're doing in life. So there is no way to get out of, if you've sinned, if you've done things wrong, you can't blame it on God. It's your own choice. The Bible also says that, that God's not going to tempt us with evil. That that's not something he does. Now we get tempted, we get tested in our faith, but he's not going to tempt us with evil. So... Hopefully you got a little bit of understanding. I, I don't know if it came out as well as I was thinking when I was preparing the sermon, but um, we see a lot of examples of God's involvement in our lives, but the, the way and the nature that he does them is very important to understand. And knowing that, you know, free will is real. We definitely have that. And God's involvement is, uh, is still limited. We see that it's not just total over everything. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, hearing us. Dear God, we thank you for the involvement that you, that you do have in our lives, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to continue to grow in our understanding of, of, of who you are and, and your nature, dear Lord, and um, the involvement that's made here. And God, I pray that you please help none of us to be deceived by the, uh, the false belief that somehow um, you're just a puppet master and, and we're all just puppets and doing every single thing that's done is just done because um, it's your will. We clearly can see that there's so many things that happen that are against your will on this earth, yet they happen, Lord, and we know that they are against your will. God, I pray that you please help us to, um, to make sure that your will is done here as it is in heaven and that you would lead us and direct us in all truth and wisdom, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.